offer ways to incorporate pedagogies of care in the online classroom. And so I think Ryan introduced us already, but I'm Missy Kofed, and my co-presenters are Marilyn Kutch and Amanda Delaman. So Amanda, Marilyn, and I were brought together last year through our participation in a year-long course on effective online teaching practices offered by the Association of College and University Educators, or the AQ course. There have been some other presentations um, from people in our cohort as well, so that may sound familiar. And I think we would all agree that our participation in this course really has changed the way that we approach our online courses. And the AQ uh, motto is really student success through exceptional teaching. So to get us started today, we just want to throw a question out there so you may feel comfortable to shout out your answer, drop it in the chat. We want to know how are you thinking about pedagogies of care? How would you define that? You may have attended some sessions throughout the day and have heard um, different vantage points of looking at pedagogies of care, but we're curious to hear and learn from you. How are you defining this? So just take a minute to drop your answer in the chat or perhaps share out if you feel comfortable to do so. Thinking about our students emotion, emotional and mental health and how our course contributes to that teaching with compassion teaching methods that demonstrate care to our students. Yes, certainly lovely ways to think about pedagogies of care. Well, Missy and Marilyn and I have an, have had an opportunity to think about our own unique definitions as well that we'd like to add. Um, I see another one added here, humanizing the digital version of students you encounter in online courses. Thank you for adding that. Let's yeah, thank ahead. you. Yeah, there. thank you all for your contributions. Yeah. Um, I think what um, the point we're trying to make here is that there are lots of different ways to think about pedagogies of care. And so we've included our own definitions here. I know that for myself, um, one of the things that I tend to think about when I think about pedagogies of care is really demonstrating respect for students' time and effort through quality course design and organization and also ensuring that my students feel valued in my courses through intentional instructor presence. Uh, I, I really believe that if we are thinking about our students, we should be placing the need, students' learning needs at the forefront of the course design and even in how we teach the concepts towards those professional application opportunities. And I want to continue to add to what's been shared in the chat and to Missy and Marilyn. And one way that I like to think about pedagogies of care is valuing the needs of the whole learner, which can include supporting those academic developments and also their social and emotional well being. And so we really just wanted to talk about in this session ways that we have tried to incorporate our own philosophies on pedagogies of care into our classes. And so we've broken this session into three parts. Um, we'll each take one and talk about how to create effective micro lectures and modules, while also considering student feedback, how to help students persist in the online learning environment through instructor presence, and how to incorporate active learning techniques in the online classroom. A resource that was made possible through ETE was last fall. Uh, I was a part of an ETE learning circle and I highly recommend if you're thinking of maybe invigorating over the course of the fall and the spring, check out the ETE learning circles. They really are amazing and you get free resources. This is actually an, an open um, 
resource too that you can use. And it's a website that involves quite a bit of how can you put it into your own uh, classroom and make it more student centered. So it's listed in our, our resource listing, but it can also be um, accessed through the USU library and you can download that ebook and you can read it at any time. So in this section of our presentation, I'll walk you through steps to consider when creating effective micro lectures and modules. And I will also talk about using student feedback to improve course design and delivery. So structure is key for students to find success and help maintain their schedule, which can help ease a lot of stress, which is more important now than ever before. We want to provide a consistent roadmap to help increase the success. And additionally, a weekly rhythm will increase participation. This helps set the students up for success right from the start. We want our students to know what to expect. You can do some things to add some variety, but providing consistency will help maximize the learning. And lastly, closing the modules with summarizing activities helps reinforce what you want students to know and even can serve as a review for upcoming assessments or cul culminating activities on a particular unit. So here are some questions you might want to consider when planning your modules. How can you be consistent while also keeping your modules engaging? Perhaps you can add in a podcast or some new way to think about a concept, but keep it simple and related to your micro lectures. Another question you might ask are what types of summaries can you include that will help students know what you wanted them to learn in each module? The closing of each module helps the students confirm what it is they need to know before moving forward. And lastly, consider how you can bridge what you're learning from one module to the next. This act of chunking the information um, is helpful for students to see how they are learning new concepts and how those connect um, to the next series of concepts, which serves as a beautiful blueprint for what they're learning all throughout your course. So now I'm going to walk you through several learning objectives for creating effective micro lectures. After participating in the year long AQ training, I made modifications to my own pre recorded micro lectures and the student feedback spoke volumes. So here are some steps that I took to help ensure that the learning was impactful and meaningful for my students. First, I made sure to chunk the information into short standalone videos. Next, I provided rich opportunities for, inter for interaction, processing, retrieval, and application. So here are some questions you might consider when planning your effective micro lectures. The students appreciate short and concise videos. So ask yourself when planning, how can I keep them short and, and simple? About seven minutes is that sweet spot. Um, this helps the students for multiple reasons. First, when they're completing the weekly module, they might need uh, to break it up due to family obligations. Um, they might need to come back and uh, revisit uh, on their own time. So bringing in that my definition of pedagogies of care, valuing the needs of the whole learner. So if they can watch these short standalone videos and maybe need to rewatch, um, the shorter versions are much more helpful to them. Next, you might ask yourself, how can I connect with my students and provide openings for them to apply what they are learning? Let them know who you are. This is so impactful in the online learning environment. Humanize the process. So we're going to show you a portion of a video that shares some helpful tips about creating super simple videos. Um, this is also linked in our resource page at the end of this presentation, which will be made available to you. So we're just going to watch a tiny portion of this now. Nobody cares about that. I'm so scared of getting the Hi. Hi, I'm Mike West, and I'm going to show you how to make a video for your class. Uh, right. Anybody? You're going to help other people get over fear. Look how fear we are. Hey, buddy, come here. Come get in the YouTube video with me. What do you think about being on camera? 
Is it weird? Yeah. Why do you think it's weird? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's weird too. I'm trying to help people be less weird about it. What if you have a job someday where you have to be on camera? <laughs> All right, don't quit your job. Here are five reasons to get on camera and put video into your course. Number one, because it puts more you and your Eunice into your class. And you matter more than anything. As Karen Costa says in 99 Tips for Creating Simple and Sustainable Educational Videos, more than content, more than course design, you are the factor in an online course that has the greatest potential to help your students succeed. So greet your students at the virtual door with a welcome video. I thought it'd be cool if we all just uploaded a video to start things off. Share something about yourself. I love to run, but I would like to add, I also love to run with my kids and ask them to do the same. You can just grab your phone like this, list these three things that you love to do. Number two, it helps build relationships. Hello world religion class. As the videos came in, I didn't care if they had bad lighting or stumbled over their words now and then. Me and my roommate just recently got a cat. I am a 24th year senior. <laughs> I really like it, but that's not really interesting. I wasn't just talking to a camera anymore. I was talking to real people. Love the introductions you guys posted. We have so many different perspectives and talent. Number three, use videos to validate and motivate students. Did you guys see Sarah's post on this? Mention great comments and celebrate great work. You guys might have seen Taylor had a really interesting experience. Offer quick words of encouragement. Hey guys, I know this week is super hard. The good news is I love to help people. If you need some help, just reach out. Number four, it'll save you time. A simple weekly overview video of a big point and videos that clarify assignment expectations allow students to get onto the questions that really matter. And you can also make short explainer videos that answer any frequently asked questions about particular concepts or ideas. Number five, implicit messaging. Video is a great way to get across the most important lessons of the class. The lesson. So I think that it does an excellent job of just describing how we can really build community, especially in these asynchronous online learning env en environments. So linking together the engagement piece with student feedback is another way to build community and to show your students that you're listening and invested in their learning. Um, Duo Kim and Ruben share that shorter videos and informal talk um, Talkhead videos are much more engaging than even those high quality pre recorded classroom lectures. So I like to use this as an opportunity to share collective feedback in the form of a two or three minute video. I can share accomplishments, um, uh, highlight creative output by the students, and even draw attention to types of on by online behavior that I want to see more of. So if students are asking higher level thinking questions in their discussion posts and you want to see more of that, these simple informal feedback videos can help encourage that type of um, interaction and engagement. So when considering um, the valuing the needs of the whole learner, honoring student feedback is of the utmost importance. So completing mid-semester and post-semester check-ins help validate that you're listening to your students' needs. And this not only helps build community, but also creates a safe space for the students to learn at their own pace. When I pivoted mid-semester after taking the AQ training to include more concise and short videos, I asked my students how it was going, and one said, I felt like the feedback was amazing, and I appreciated that your lecture videos were concise and not longer than they needed to be. And when I provided openings for my students to interact with one another more often in the online asynchronous setting, they told me they valued those experiences, as you can see here in these last two testimonials. The one student said, I really liked learning from my classmates this semester and bouncing ideas off of one another. Additionally, another benefit of providing openings for students to share feedback links back to my original definition of pedagogies of care, and that includes valuing this, the needs of the whole learner. The back and forth feedback helped them feel seen, which in turn prompted more engagement and motivation. And I see this as a win-win for everyone. Next, Missy is going to talk about more about the importance of demonstrating respect for students' time and effort through quality course design and organization. 
So in this section of our presentation, I really want to look at how I've tried to help students persist in online learning through maintaining instructor presence. This was something that was really challenging for me because I teach really large asynchronous courses. And so um, the AQ course helped me make a more intentional effort to be very present and connect with my students. Um, I feel like this is particularly essential to demonstrate in the online classroom because of the absence of those casual conversations that typically occur before, after, and during live classes. So according to Garrison, Anderson, and Archer, there are three types of instructor presence, social teaching, and cognitive presence. So when we look at these different types of presence, social presence is really just allowing your students to see you as a human being with your own hobbies and interests. Teaching presence looks to guide students' learning um, experiences by designing coursework and directing and guiding students' interactions with your assignments and your course resources. And cognitive presence supports mentors and guides students' intellectual growth. All three types of instructor presence are essential for a successful educational experience. And so some of the ways that I started to implement in implement this, sorry, in my class, um, I wanna share with you right now. I purposely tried to choose low barrier approaches that can be implement, implemented fairly easily and without taking a lot of time, which we know is always a limited resource. So one of the things that I tweaked a little bit in my courses was to start sending a welcome message to my students about a week before the class starts. I used to send them a welcome message the day the semester started. And I found that by sending them a welcome message about a week before class starts, that really helps to relieve some of the anxiety that students feel about the unknown. You can also make a short video like we just um, saw in Amanda's section of the talk. And including a few personal facts about yourself allows students to see you as a person and not just a facilitator behind the screen. I've also found that allowing students to view the course and the syllabus before the class starts provides them with information that will allow them to plan for the upcoming semester. And it provides you as the instructor the opportunity to address any questions or concerns before the course even begins. And so when students know what to expect, they can hit the ground running on the first day of the semester without having to spend those first few days learning how to navigate the course. Another thing that I started doing this past year is sharing research on growth mindset with my students. And so if you're unfamiliar with the definitions, a fixed mindset is the belief that intelligence is predetermined and unchangeable well, a growth mindset is the belief that intelligence is transformational and that anything through effort can be learned. I've started sharing um, research on a growth mindset to my students, typically after my first exam. The way my course is set up, not all of their exams count toward their grades, so it's a great time to provide them with this research and allow them time to adjust and adapt their um, preparation for the course. And I started doing this because many students who don't perform well initially in my class feel like they don't have the potential to be successful in a chemistry course. And so I like to take the time to remind them that performing poorly on an exam is not a reflection of their intelligence or their capacity for success, but rather a reflection on how they prepare for the exam and that this preparation can be altered and adjusted moving forward. I found that often students are not aware that failure is an essential part of growth. And so I also like to share with them stories of um, some famous failures, for example, Albert Einstein or Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jordan, Steve Jobs. And if you're comfortable sharing examples of your own experience with failure is also a great way to demonstrate social presence. The last approach that I wanted to just mention in this talk is um, providing individualized feedback to my students. And like I said, I teach classes that um, typically have between three and 400 students. And so providing individualized feedback is almost impossible to give every student um, original individualized feedback, but I've tried to implement some techniques so that students are at least getting some um, feedback from me. I try to recognize success, 
but also to recognize progress and also to reach out to students that are struggling. And another thing that I've started doing is um, sending just friendly reminders with respect to due dates, because even though students in the college course shouldn't necessarily have to be micromanaged, I found that those reminders are well received by students, particularly at the beginning of the semester while they're still getting acclimated to a course. So one of the techniques that I've used to provide feedback in my courses is to use the message students who feature. If you're unfamiliar with this, you can just go into the Canvas gradebook and there's three little dots by an assignment. You can scroll down to message student two and you can select from a few different options. So you can gently remind students who haven't submitted an assignment yet that that's still missing. You can congratulate students that have scored higher than a certain score on an assignment or exam, or encourage students who maybe have scored below a threshold um, score. I've also taken time sometimes to just scroll through my gradebook and make notes of students who demonstrated significant progress from one assignment or one exam to the next. And then you can send them either just a standard message that you've typed up or even taking those standard messages and tailoring them slightly for specific students. Um, I found students appreciate that as well. And so the feedback I've gotten from students um, was a little bit shocking to me actually because I've sent out fairly generic messages to a lot of my students in my courses. I thought that they, they wouldn't really be that impressed with that. But the first um, message that I sent out, which was just recognizing students who were staying on pace with the course, this was last fall, all of a sudden my email inbox started just ping, ping, ping. And I panicked for a second because usually that's not a good sign if your email is blowing up. But uh, the feedback from students was, Thank you for acknowledging my hard work. Thank you for acknowledging my effort. They were very, very grateful to have their effort and success being noticed and acknowledged. And additionally, I found that reaching out to students first in any capacity provides them with a direct pathway by which they're able to then contact you with questions or concerns. And this isn't something that I've necessarily tried to quantify or document, but I have definitely had students respond to emails that I've sent them telling me of concerns that they're having or struggles that they're having or reaching out with questions that I don't think would have reached out to me on their own. So just opening up that line of communication allowed them with just a very easy, low barrier way for them to um, contact me and get the help that they needed. So overall, what I've taken away from this is that students are very aware and appreciative of the effort that you put into your course as an instructor. And so for the last part of our presentation, Marilyn is going to talk about how um, she has incorporated the active learning cycle into her courses. Thank you so much. It's 440. I have five minutes left. No, with questions. Um, again, quality is equal to caring. And we know just as you have decided to sit in an afternoon session on a Wednesday, um, that you really want to learn, just like our students are being uh, part of our online or hybrid um, classes, they're choosing to be there. So if we're respecting their time, let's create something that's worthwhile and really put our effort into choosing activities that are going to deliver the biggest return on their learning. We also, in staying with the same uh, theme of our, our conference, we need to ensure that students will engage with our course material and make those connections to our course goals that we established from the very beginning. We may also need to change something and make a stronger presence in the course to encourage student engagement and participation. And this is why I chose to talk about the active learning cycle, because it allows for us in a structured way to begin to look at what we deliver and really give our students what they need to learn in the shortest amount of time. 
If we provide more opportunities for the students to enter the learning space through positive interactions and opportunities for safe exchanges, exchanges of their ideas and thoughts, we provide a community of active learning. For example, think about uh, when you have uh, in, done something like a, an anticipatory set where you have prompted your students with a concept. That's the first stage of the active learning. That's prompting an inquiry through a concept exploration or maybe a quote, or maybe you have talked to your students about maybe something, a failure that you've done. Uh, one other thing you can do in the second uh, layer of the active learning cycle, you can build on what you just engaged with your students by having them um, go through expert concept introduction in maybe a video or a short reading assignment through a discussion. The third stage of the active learning cycle is to ensure that now they can apply that through a concept application. And this is where we want them to really follow up with how they will implement it into their learning. So the first stage, like I talked about, was to prompt them with inquiry into the concept exploration. In these three stages, we really want to start with our first stage, that is to wake up their brain allow for their interest to be uh, peaked with our course content. And if you think about it, just because you learn that way doesn't mean that they really should learn that way. Maybe we need to refresh our courses and look at how the learning engagement goes back to our learning goals and then come up with a unique video, just like Amanda was showing us with that really cool way, just with your phone, putting it, making it real, coming up with a question or even a quote. Um, as a as a um, instructor that teaches pre-service secondary ed teachers, I always like to include my fails, like what did not work when I was a classroom teacher, and that makes it more deliberate in my course goal, so my students remember it. You could even think of a think pair share. You can do this in a discussion format in your online class, or even when you use your chat feature going into groups. That's another way we can prompt inquiry through cons concept exploration. The next stage, uh, when we think about pair shares, you can um, go even further and have a specific amount of time that you're giving your students to cover a topic. So if you want for them in a discussion post to do a, uh, maybe something they've seen before or have them uh, try a question that you've like in today's uh, keynote speakers, they had us go out and do scenarios. That's one way where we can prompt more concept exploration in an online format. The second stage is to build student knowledge and skills through that introduction. That is to peak them with the inquiry piece and then go into building into knowledge and skills through micro lectures. Please don't make it 25 minutes. I have one that I absolutely cannot stand and it has been cut down to less than 10. We all know that our students time is valuable. That's caring. Remember, quality is equal to caring. Let's go back and look at ways that we are going to be engaging them. Maybe outline how to work through a problem. I like it when people show me an expert who knows this, it, whether it's you interview someone or maybe you have a student go out and um, they you ask them to maybe post a video of something that they have seen in their own um, clinical experience. I think also our students, they like to listen because they're doing multitasking at the same time. An example of what I have used, and my students really enjoy this, is the exploration of a concept called secondary dimensions of culture and cultural identity. And I have this uh, podcast that I, I had them listen to, and it's called, Hello, My Name is Marijuana Pepsi. The title alone gets them intrigued. What is this about? And as they listen to it, it's a, it comes from the perspective of a woman who has an e educational doctoral degree, and her name is Dr. Marijuana Pepsi. And she talks about schooling and the impact of secondary dimensions of culture and cultural identity. And with that audio piece, it engages, it piques them, and they begin that concept introduction, and they fill out what, what that really means from an expert. The next layer is to have your students uh, 
apply that? Why would we go to all this trouble if we didn't want them to apply it? Uh, one thing that you can do to apply that concepts into their new knowledge, into their, their new learning, into the long-term memory is for them to have opportunities to apply it. So one example that uh, we learned about in our AQ is to give options. So in this concept application I've given in the, you can, you can see it in the slide, is to allow for them to have choices. So they're not always just doing the same thing every time. It also lets them find out how maybe, oh, maybe I could do one, but let's do two. Maybe I could do the third one. So they have um, the ability to look at different scenarios, different problems, and yet it allows for it to be more personalized and really put into that long-term understanding. Uh, at this time, we're out of time. But I want to say that if you have an opportunity to just even implement one thing, remember President, Vice President Galley said, if there's anything you learned today, just try one thing and try to really change your classes. So maybe we have something that you could try and really implement to engage and create more of a um, pedagogies of care in your classroom. We will share our slides and these resources here too that we've linked on the um, Mighty Networks app as well.